Stay hungry, stay foolish. We all know a visionary leader when we see one. They're bold and prophetic and at the same time pragmatic. They don't just promote change, they drive it while inspiring and mobilizing others to do the same. Visionaries like Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos possess a host of innate qualities that make them extraordinary. But what truly sets them apart is their ability to turn vision into action. Our guest today introduces a new way of thinking and managing called Future Back that enables any manager to become a practical visionary. Addressing the many barriers to change that exist in established organizations, he presents a systematic approach to overcoming them that includes the principles and mindset that allow leadership teams to look beyond typical short-term planning horizons, a method for turning emerging challenges into growth opportunities that can define an organization's future, a step-by-step -step guide for translating a vision into a strategic plan that teams can align around and commit to, and ways to ensure that visionary thinking becomes a repeatable organizational capability. We welcome co-founder of InnoSight, an author of Lead from the Future, How to Turn Visionary Thinking into Breakthrough Growth. Mark Johnson, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. Great to be here. Your colleague, Scott Anthony, has been a friend of the show and indeed two-time guest, so it's a real pleasure to have you on the show, Mark. You start the book with a tribute to your co-founder of InnoSight and your partner and friend and somebody who has inspired so many of us, and I'm sure so many of our listeners today, me included. And we can't start the show before we salute the great Clayton Christensen. Indeed, you dedicate this book to Clayton. I do. To me, Clay was the epitome of a visionary of somebody who used his work in disruptive innovation and disruptive theory to be able to look ahead and try to make the world a better place. I mean, at the essence of what he talked about in disruption was not the negative side of it. You know, hey, a company's going to get toppled or you better watch out, put in the fear side of things. It was more on the optimistic side and it was more on the hopeful side for our society and the world of the essence as it evolved of disruptive innovation was how does it enable a set of non-consumers, uh, people that were less wealthy or less skilled had less access to goods and service. How do you enable this larger population of less skilled or less wealthy people to have access to goods and services through the thinking of disruption and how that could democratize things? So I've just felt it fitting to dedicate this to Clay, not only because of the way he thought, but the way he influenced the world and influenced it in a way not just professionally, but morally good. He was an amazing human being, kind and supportive of anybody that was around him and would engage with the individual and make them feel special. Both professionally and personally, I dedicate the book because of the influence he's had, not just on me, but on the world in multiple dimensions. So speaking of visionaries like Clay, you start the book by emphasizing how we need vision. However, you point out that when InnoSight, your company surveyed senior executives, you found that 75% never planned more than five years out. And here you recommend a different approach. And I quote you here when you say, leaders who think about the future, but then focus on sustaining or efficiency improvement may believe that they have a long-term vision and strategy, but often what they have is a glorified operating plan that perpetuates their assumptions about how their markets work today. I think that absolutely nails the essence of what you're getting at with this book. Absolutely. It is part and parcel why we wrote it, you know, having started as an innovation firm and realizing that so many of the major breakthrough innovation efforts, those that require a different business model, a business model change, they weren't making traction because not so much the innovation teams, but the leaders who had the resource allocation responsibilities weren't looking out far enough to have the right mindset and perspective to allow breakthrough innovation efforts, the space, the time they need to incubate in scale. And, you know, a big piece of what we found in doing this work, both by experience and research, is what we call the present forward fallacy, that just so many companies have this seductive notion that an existing business can be extended out in time indefinitely, you know, just continuing to make improvements to it. I mean, Clay 
essentially referred to this when he said sustaining innovations that overshoot. But I think there's a behavioral piece of it or a mindset piece behind that, which is the present forward fallacy that I think we are living in a world where businesses always will sharpen the pencil the following year and produce a business plan or a budget that suggests that their business is going to grow indefinitely year after year. And that failure to look ahead and be honest about the fact that some businesses will continue to grow, but others will start to plateau and, and, and others will actually be in decline, you know, I think is one of the biggest maladies that we face in general management today. And on that, I'm going to jump way ahead in the book because I loved when you referenced Jeff Bezos, and he's a real hero of future back thinking. And he even said, someday Amazon will fail. And he predicts that his own business that he built with his blood, sweat and tears and brilliant thinking will go bankrupt one day. Yeah, no, it was an amazing quote. It sort of, I think, probably floored everybody when they first heard him say it or when they first read it. It's along the lines of the great management guru, Peter Drucker, you know, who talked about every business has an underlying theory or there's a theory to the business. That theory sooner or later no longer works because either things change in the market or things change in the business or both. And what we find, I think, is individual business units have a life cycle to them. The overall enterprise, I think, can go on almost like you think about the, the generational the ongoing perpetuation through generations of of human beings. I think it's the same with companies. You know, if we could be more capable of understanding the the life cycle of individual business and value propositions and that they're probably getting shorter as technology and knowledge move faster and and have the agility to not only operate and execute businesses, but explore and envision, discover new opportunities that are best developed by looking further than just a couple of years out and bringing that back to the seeds of today. If you can create this ongoing effort to operate and execute, but also explore and envision, discover new different growth, then I think you can overcome, at least for a long period of time, what Jeff Bezos is talking about, because you really are ultimately evolving into a new being over many, many years. And I think you could probably see that in a lot of companies that have been around a long time, like Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson. And its day before its demise, Nokia didn't start out as a mobile phone manufacturer. So there are examples of this, you know, sort of transformational way that organizations can be to sustain long-term growth. Vision is important. And that's important in normal times. That's important in business as usual times. And you and your co-author, Josh Suskowitz, just wrote an article in the HBR in the Harvard Business Review where you emphasize it's even more vital in this post-COVID world because most businesses will be looking just to get back to a recovery vision. So you talk about actually that's not enough because the world is going to be vastly different when we do get back to zero. And we need to have a longer term vision. And that's going to be difficult for a lot of us. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to frame it, Aiden. You know, recovery vision, I think, could be linked to the present forward fallacy, right? Just the assumption that things get back to normal extrapolates from today. That's kind of a linear function, not to get too academic, right? It's just a straight line. We just somehow pick up on the straight line versus it's an S curve or it's a step change, it's a transformative function. I think the likelihood, if anybody really spends some time considering all the trends that have been moved up, way up, accelerated points of inflection that now are happening in the next couple of years that might have been further out, these are all going to drive fundamental change in industries and businesses where you can't go present forward um, and extrapolate out as a straight line. You actually have to look into that future and not only the five to 10 year horizon we talk about in the book, but because everything's moved up, you also need to look, I would say, over the next 12 to 24 months and look from the future back to say, how do we see the world changed, the assumptions behind that view, and then how do we put ourselves in the world with the most hopeful future, while also recognizing with all the uncertainty, you're going to have to plan for different scenarios. Many leaders who listen to this show will probably be listening, kind of going, that's well and good, but I need to 
pay my people. I need to get the business back into profitability. We've lost a couple of quarters, whatever it may be by the time we come out of this. But one of the things anyway that a lot of us suffer from is short-sightedness of leadership where calendars are filled with linear governance and oversight in a present forward manner. And this takes up most of our times. It does. We call that in the book, the tyranny of the urgent. In fact, the urgencies of budgets and business planning and dealing with operations and the fact that we have more data than ever, you know, more computing power than ever, I think most would agree has not freed up our time, but actually has made our time busier. I think we're living in a sea of data. You know, T.S. Eliot once said, where is the knowledge lost in information? And then where's the wisdom lost in knowledge? I think we suffer with information overload and, and all kinds of tools and techniques to drive efficiencies and improvements in the business. And that just further and further crowds out the ability to think in a visionary way, to think about the art of the possible, the organization, what things could be different about it in the future. And as you said, in the COVID-19 crisis, that becomes even a stronger pull for the here and now. And the criticism would back to me would be, we have to just make sure we survive. We have to, all these things that are immediate actions. And I agree with all of that. But I think the point that we make, whether in these times or, or just in general times, is you need to carve out a little bit of time of the management team and other groups, 10%, maybe 20% of the time each week in this situation to be able to look past the COVID crisis, that 12 to 24 month horizon and begin to think about how things are going to be different. And then how do you fit in that different world? And what does that lend to, not just in terms of addressing permanent change that could be to your detriment, but probably more importantly, what are the opportunities? What are the things that can actually re-energize and reset your organization as Satya Nadella talked about in his book, Hit Refresh for Microsoft. There's an opportunity to renew and refresh coming out of these difficult times. So I think there's this great opportunity, and it's important that we give some of the space and recognize that 10 to 20% is vital, even if it doesn't feel urgent. Yeah, and one of the things you talk about, and I'm, I'm jumping again all over the place in the book here, is that... Maybe CEOs, for example, will hire a chief innovation officer or an innovation team and expect them to do all the work, right? Or else they'll loan some workers to a project for a certain amount of time. And you say a couple of things here, and I'm going to quote you again. One is that it's better to have one individual at 100% working at something rather than two at 40% each of their time because they just can't succeed. That's one thing. And then the other one is, and this one really nailed home, and I shared this one on social media, and so many innovators liked and retweeted it, et cetera, and it goes as follows. No matter how good the chief innovation officer may be, no matter how creative an entrepreneurial and innovation team, they cannot successfully create new market growth for an organization unless the leadership team is directly involved in their work, guiding them with their long-term vision and strategy helping them to create the right processes to move their ventures forward and protecting them from the competition from the core. Absent that high-level attention, those ventures might never get off the ground in the first place. Amen to that. <laughs> um, it, you know, that, Aiden, you know, I'm, I'm liking my own writing. Um, you know, we have found... <laughs> You're like, at last, we, and, and posting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we have found... This is perhaps, and maybe this is why, you know, other fellow innovators have appreciated it. It's the number one imperative, I think, for 21st century management is to recognize that the leadership team cannot delegate off completely innovation. We had a CEO summit. We had the CEO of Panera Bread and who former CEO of ABP. He was the founder also. And he said, I have to be the innovator in chief. Doesn't mean you can't have a chief innovation officer, but the leadership team own the resource allocation process. If they're not involved and get aligned and committed to a long-term growth plan and the innovation that needs to come behind it, they will not properly sponsor and govern innovation teams through all of the ups and downs they're going to face, the antibodies of the core that are going to go after them, they're not going to get 
the kind of backing that they need to be able to last over more than just a couple of years to be able to fully incubate and scale, and, and including you know even M and A, you know putting it all together, it's still going to take time. So, number one challenge I think in management is leadership has to change its mindset and become able to learn to be able to engage a long-term strategy and innovation process, be able to talk about what are major areas of opportunity and be able to understand that and use that understanding to get behind a portfolio of innovation opportunities and then shepherd them along the way. There's too much of one and done. There's too much of operate and execute and give me data and make decisions and let that more creative stuff just go with the innovation teams and the CIO. And it never works. You have to be in a parallel process of what the leadership team is tracking in terms of the development of breakthrough growth and what these innovation teams are on the ground day to day trying to make happen. And then the other side, right? So that's the leadership side. But if you're an innovator, and we have many listen to this show, change makers, entrepreneurs, people trying to make those transformations within organizations, it can be a dangerous role. I've been there. And if you're delegated the future of the business, essentially, by the CEO, and then they go and leave you, and a loose leash is good. But if the leash is too loose, and there's no checking in time, right, it can be a quite a dangerous place. And you talk about this in the book that Leadership needs to dedicate some time, like a retreat time off-site, away from business as usual, in order to get their head around the future of the business. When we were doing work for a, a U.S.-based automotive company, one of the things that we learned in the course of the work was that BMW senior leadership, we learned this anecdotally, by the way, so I don't know where they are at this point, but when we talked about it, that that, that leadership team was spending one full day a quarter talking about the future and the implications of that future and what they needed to do about it as they were facing, as all of automotive industry participants are facing, the potential intersection between electrification, autonomy, and connectivity and what that could do to fundamentally change. And then business model innovation, like with Uber and Lyft and so forth, how that all comes together to transform the industry. And so carving out that time has been something like BMW has done. And I think other companies and other industries are starting to do. And in this case, to track with innovation teams, spending whatever that time is, you know, again, in in say a non-COVID crisis world, I'd say maybe it is just once a quarter, but it's dedicated time not to review data and information and make decisions in a very linear way. It's actually time to be expansive exploratory and really debate and discuss about assumptions and be able to work with these innovation teams of what's working, what's not. I think the essence of successful, to your point about being very lonely, innovation teams that are truly on disruptive breakthrough growth, yes, they've got to be separate in the sense that if they're in the core, the processes, the rules and norms, the core are going to affect what this breakthrough team needs to create in terms of potentially a new business model and so forth. But it needs to be very tightly tied, you know, almost get the ability to go straight up to the top and be connected to top leadership that, again, are the ones that can sponsor and govern, adjudicate challenges between the core and what breakthrough teams are doing, make sure that resources are flowing to them in the right way, sharing capabilities in the right way, all of that you know, it has to be this sort of three actor play, right? You've got the breakthrough team, you've got the core organization, and then you have senior leadership. And senior leadership has to be the orchestra conductor helping to manage progress, you know, on both sides of the ledger. This is a real challenge. I've met many innovators and they all suffer from this. And I did myself where if you don't have that direct access where you can tell the bare knuckle truth about how it is, what's happening, warts and all. You'll have a translator who's trying to sugarcoat it or put rose tinted glasses on what it will look like or what the real facts are. And oftentimes the message gets lost in translation or message sent does not equate to message received. Or worst case, they'll get rid of the innovator because the innovator is exposing 
a business model that needs to be re- reinvented or maybe something that needs to be culled within the organization. And people will hang on to that because oftentimes their status or their career in a way is tied to that part of the business that needs to be let go of. I couldn't agree more on that, Aiden. And what's worse is what we find with leadership teams when it comes to trying to move beyond the status quo back to the present forward fallacy, when it comes time to consider transformation or at a minimum, you know, getting beyond the core to fill a growth gap and anticipate things that are going to be needed to sustain, be sustainable, not just profitable. We see there's sort of three camps that can often be in leadership teams. A third of them can fully get that way of thinking and be on board. A third aren't really on board. And it's not because they don't want to be on board. They just can't, they can't get into an entrepreneurial or innovative mindset. They're more delivery oriented. So it's very hard for them to embrace the abstract nature, the ambiguity of trying to develop past what they've known and done all those years in terms of of a long-term business model. But then there's a third that actually kind of get it don't want to get it. And, you know, they don't want to rock the boat. They feel like we ought to just stay the course. They're more conservative for various reasons. So that's, again, why it's so important for a CEO, for leadership to engage in a learning process and be able to tease out what's really behind individuals' minds on the team, because that is another factor that can derail the process of successful innovation and the resource allocation to drive those innovation efforts. And quite frankly, we advise leaders that in flushing out these real deep assumptions about the worth of different innovation efforts, if they just can't get with it, then they're going to just hold back the organization from its ability to change and to evolve and to transform in the ways it needs to. And top leaders need to make decisions about, as Jim Collins would say, who needs to be on the bus and, and who needs to come off the bus. Yeah, and that's the difficult thing, isn't it? Because oftentimes leadership befriends people within the organization. Yep. And a lot of cognitive biases get in the way. And I'd love to cover a little bit about this, Mark, because we mentioned those people. So there's those who who want to change. There's those who just cannot see it. And no matter how many times or how many ways you translate your message, they just won't let go of the past. And cognitive bias gets in the way. Yes, it does. I mean, I think it does for anybody. And I did write about this in the book. I won't go over all of them. Actually, I, I laid out eight of them that are part of the behavioral economics domain, I guess, organizational psychology, people like Daniel Kahneman and Amos Fersky have talked at length about you know some of the biases in general, but I think specific to the ability to, if you will, get it or or you know sort of get past short termism or the status quo. You know there are things like bounded rationality, which is you know the instinct to solve based on what's just immediately in front of us, the information at hand, or aut- automaticity. Uh, automaticity, which is, you know, hey, we always do things a certain way and we kind of get used to it and we just do it over and over. Or hyperbolic discounting, you know, the tendency to choose a smaller reward, you know, that we can get now um, over a, you know, over a larger one that would be received later. And there's a lot of others like loss aversion and sunk costs. And anyway, these biases, even for the best of us, you know, if best of us in terms of, of being entrepreneurial or being innovative and you know, really out of the box. They are part of us as human beings and they lead us to to think about the short term and they give us this present forward fallacy, which is to really want to deeply hold on to today's paradigm and keep extrapolating that into the future. And it's probably doubly hard right now because evolutionary psychologists talk about this when danger is lurking, we tend to narrow our scope even more and hunker down even further to your point earlier. And that's going to make it even harder with the COVID crisis to be able to open the aperture and look beyond. But I would just again say, not only is that an imperative to have this vision, but I think it's also going to be those that can think long-term, like a Steve Jobs at Apple during the dot-com crash looking past his organization in 2000 to create the digital hub and all the different uh, consumer electronic products he did. Those that can do what he did in a time of crisis 
are going to have the opportunity over those that stay beholden to their cognitive biases and in this narrowing, you know, as we all feel threatened justifiably. But that's where we have to really have courage and get beyond our tendencies to have a behavioral change. Yeah. And we'll come back to jobs because I think that case study you gave of the digital hub, it's a mindset that many may have missed and it absolutely personifies and exemplifies the idea of future back. And let's go to future back thinking now, because this is not, it's not just a strategy or it's not just a way of working. It's a way of thinking. Yes, it is a way of thinking. In writing the book, we had started just with process, you know, a way of working or literally think about the future and put yourself in and that work back. But as we dug into it, we realized, as you said, Aiden, it's, it's as much, if not more so, a way of thinking. It's a, it's getting past these cognitive biases. It's, I use a spread in the book to compare present forward and future back thinking because I think it's important to have the right perspective of the vision that you're developing that that you break free from the present and the past. It's about things like what could be versus what is in order to break free from the past. It's literally clean sheet, zero base budgeting kind of way of starting things about the future as opposed to point solutions or talking about like existing budgets. We're focused on being imaginative and creative. You know, we're developing a a system a business system, if you will, of the future of core, adjacent, and new at the high level to begin to imagine not just a two-sentence statement about what the organization strives to do, but literally a future state architecture of how those core, adjacent, and new businesses come together to drive a growth plan, to drive a growth aspiration. So, Future back is really about letting go, making a clean break of the present and the past to open up the mind of the art of the possible to not be stuck in the orthodoxies of today. It doesn't mean you won't bring it back to today and compare to the way things are. You know, no one is saying that you just throw out everything that happens now. But for the exercise, for the ability to begin to be a future back visionary and thinker and drive the process, you've got to have the right mindset. You have to think in the right way. Otherwise, your vision is going to suffer from that present forward fallacy problem, which is that you're basically extending your business out indefinitely. Yeah, maybe you look out five to 10 years and you say, I'm a long term thinker. But if you're just extrapolating from today, that's the present forward fallacy. That's not a true breakthrough vision, transformative vision that can drive the organization. And that mindset, I mean, even with this show, I have a broad range of guests and mainly what there are about it is extending human potential in some way, because that's what I see so linked to the idea of a future back thinker or a regenerative thinker or somebody who's interested in transformation or evolution of any kind. Because organizations are just masses of individuals, and the individuals themselves need to embrace change. Therefore, things like even mindfulness helps you overcome cognitive biases. Things like looking after your health helps extend your brain power, etc. I'd love just your 10 cents on how future back thinkers or innovative thinkers actually look after the holistic approach to their lives. Wow, that's a great question, Aiden. One is the looking after your life in terms of the the importance of renewal and growth you know having that as a perspective to your point you know mindfulness the ability to reconsider or rethink things i mean this is the danger you know and i think steve jobs talked about this the danger is the entrepreneur holds on to the idea for too long and it's not willing to let it go because it's his or her baby, you know, and, and that's kind of been sometimes the challenges of going from visionary led to managerially led. So one is, I think, taking care of yourself is to be able to say that I think life is a constant path of growth. And therefore, what would be an organization is to be able to constantly think about what is it that brings meaning? What does purpose mean? And that can change over time based on circumstances. How is your purpose fulfilled, you know, as the world changes and that different jobs to be done, if you will, need to get addressed? I think it's an openness 
to change. You know, it's an openness to rethink and reconsider for the purposes of professional, you know, organizational and individual growth. You talk next in the book about the four most common failure modes for transformative innovations in large organizations. And this got me thinking that there's many, many different stats out there, but something like 75% plus of transformation efforts fail. And I actually genuinely think it's more than that. I, I really do. I think even if you do everything right, it doesn't guarantee success. But if you're a leader in a business, you may as well do everything right and try and put all the things in the right place. But you do highlight these four common failure modes, and it's really helpful to actually know what they are. And I'd love if you'd share them with our audience. Sure. You know, and it kind of goes back to our earlier conversation about if you don't have leaders that develop a point of view about the future and how not just what the core organization needs to be in, but how are we going to have to go beyond that? And this is what kind of drove the importance of tying innovation to strategy and leadership. We find over and over again, the first failure mode is being too late to the party. You know, leaders recognize the need for growth or trying to do something that's breakthrough, but they don't commit to it until the competitors are are far along you know, in the process of things, Digital Equipment Corporation, when it finally got into the personal computer business, if they suffered actually from the first two modes, they were too late to the game. Uh, you know, even though they had experimentation going on pretty early on, but they never really applied any serious effort to it. And that kind of gets the second mode. If the first one's too late, the second one is too few resources that they start to organize and adopt for initiative, but they just fail to allocate sufficient dollars. They're really not behind it. You know, it kind of goes back to that idea of, you know, we'll put a couple people on this for 10% of their time or, you know, maybe even five people. They're they're giving it lip service, but they're not really committed to it because the pull of the core and all the needs of the core are trumping the ability to really commit to this breakthrough growth because they don't have any vision for it or any kind of alignment behind it. So they don't really allocate sufficient resources. The third is things get underway really well. They do give it sufficient resources, but we call it impatient for growth. These ventures, you know, they tend to be slow to bloom, right? Because you want to mitigate the risk as you're trying to discover the viable business model. So these things tend to take time and management starts to get impatient. They see slower than expected results. They're hoping some of these initiatives will help their profitability or you know, short-term financials. And so they get impatient and they start to think about ways to redesign the effort to make things go faster at the peril of the effort, or they'll just ultimately pull the plug because there needs to be more resources into the core because there's some kind of challenge that's happening in the core. So that's the third. And then the fourth is competition from the core, which is kind of similar. There's just, it becomes a full challenge in the core. There's a, there's a effort that's underway that just takes more and more resources and, and nobody's fully into this breakthrough growth effort to begin with because nobody sees where it's really going to go. So they, they yank the resources out or in a misguided effort to create efficiencies, they'll cram the successful venture back into the core organization. This is what Kodak did with digital. You know, Willie Shi, who's now teaching at the Harvard Business School, headed up the digital unit. It was actually doing quite well. There came a time when Kodak was just basically feeling competition with core resources and trying to be more efficient, pulled that division back into the core organization and basically crushed it. And we all know the outcome of, of really where Kodak is is today, which is unfortunate. But those are the four major uh, failure modes, too late, too few resources, being impatient for the growth, not giving it the time, and basic competition from the core for resources. The third one there at the moment, that, that one really pulled on my heartstrings at the moment in the current downturn that we're going to experience. Like, like there's no doubt we're going to hit a recession of sorts here. Right. And what often happens is you'll have some innovation team, and I'm sure some guys listen to the show at the moment are going to go, oh, I don't know what is the future holds for me. I mean, the immediate future here, because oftentimes the core needs to survive and it will shut down its new emerging growth. And it may fast forward that impatience. So it may be kind of going, oh, well, it wasn't going anywhere anyway. 
and you'll have CFOs or maybe decision makers stepping in and going, well, that makes sense to actually cut that and we'll just go into survival mode. And this is against all best practice for innovation efforts. It completely is, Aiden. And I think I think the the challenge that these organizations need to recognize is they may double down on their core and for survival mode, but what if the core really is insufficient for the longevity of the organization and, and becomes magnified because of the COVID crisis? What if it's just that business model is, comes into question or it needs to be changed? So you could play that game harder, but what happens if the game needs to change or you even need a completely new game? I mean, an example that we know a number of colleges or universities are facing is executive education. We know Harvard Business School is, and others are, need to think through their executive education program and what does it mean to bring executives from around the world in person without an opportunity maybe that they would be able to do some things from a distance learning point of view because it may take some time before people can come back onto campus. So the getting online in the right way is something that needs to be considered in universities, in business schools. And that's not going to be enough just to say, you know, how do we tighten up in what we're doing to try to improve our curriculum? There's going to be more fundamental existential questions that have to be part of the mix and where there's going to need to be a carve out, no matter how painful it might seem to take any resources away. But again, it's not about taking significant percentage of the funds. It's really in the people. It's about 10% or some amount just to be able to get started, to be able to figure out its role in the future. But not putting any time into that is a big mistake. Let's talk about some of the future back and present forward differences. And the book is broken into four parts, principles, application, making future back repeatable, and then the broader implications. And we won't have time to cover all four, but I'd love to start with principles and compare like you referred to earlier on, the the dominant present forward approach to future back thinking. And here I love how you started this part of the book with the incremental improvements we witnessed in the transport system. And you said the inventors of those early trains and cars weren't thinking out what was to come, but they were thinking from what already was. I have actually, uh, as you know, a picture in the book of a early train from the 1831. And And the train has a different front end. You know, it has a locomotive. It looks like a very early locomotive version, but it does look like a locomotive. But the cars behind it are stagecoaches. They literally look like stagecoaches where you could put a horse in front of it. There's nothing different about them. And so what I wrote about, you know, this kind of ties back to the present forward fallacy or, you know, sort of moving from the present of the paradigm and just extrapolating it indefinitely into the future you know the inventors of you know of this new technology this steam locomotive technology they took basically the transportation concept of the day you know the, the stagecoach with the horse and um they coupled that with with this new technology and then they just projected it out into a world without imagining what other development you know what new you know back to future back thinking what is the art of the possible, what could be as opposed to incrementing off today of, of what already is. And, and, you know, so they didn't really use it, at least initially, uh, to, to truly make locomotive technology a new propellant of possibility, as we say. And I think that, you know, so often is the challenge we have as a, that as a metaphor of our established organizations is they're just perpetuating with all of the cognitive biases, with all of the financial rewards and incentive system that further exacerbate this, with all of the overload in terms of our time constraints, you know, again, the tyranny of the urgent, it's just putting us into this uh, present forward mode exclusively. There's nothing wrong with being present forward, by the way, 90%, 80 to 90% of what we need to do is present forward. It's about taking our core business that drives the cash flow and continuing to incrementally improve it, or even maybe breakthrough improvements that sustain the trajectory of of the ongoing work of the core, but not having any time and any process to go future back 
to envision the art of the possible and the, the potential need for transformative efforts to happen is a huge mistake. And it's a huge mistake, not only in that it's not happening very often day to day, when it does happen, there's this assumption, you know, you can do a major strategic review once every couple of years or once every five years. And that's just not the way the world works anymore. Things happen way too quickly to be able to think you can do this every once in a while. As you say there, the present is really important because it's what feeds the future in a way. And even when great innovators such as Elon Musk, DeLorean, and Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway, when they embrace the future and paint that picture to the future, they must equally master the present because if they don't, the venture will ultimately fail. You know, kind of back to the the role of the entrepreneur and then moving to a professionally managed company, can't emphasize enough, and I appreciate you bringing those up, Aiden, because we don't want to swing this too far the other way and, you know, future back, future back, future back and disparage present forward. You know, we give a couple examples of back to Jeff Bezos and Amazon, they're relentless executors. And at the same time, they've created unprecedented industries like cloud computing and ebooks and conversational computing. So it's definitely you have to do both. And the dominant mode is present forward. But but not having future back at all, as we've talked about, that inhibits the ability for any innovation effort, breakthrough innovation effort to be successful. So We've got to bring future back thinking and process beyond just innovation teams to especially the leadership teams of organizations to be able to do both, to be able to be successful at execution, but also to be able to create and discover the new opportunities, the major opportunities that are going to be the seeds of future growth. Talking about legacy organizations, so long-term crystallized organizations, if you want to call them that. Unfortunately, for many of those organizations, they're led by people much less future facing than the original founders. And here you remind us what the economist Herbert Simon said, where economic man maximizes, selects the best alternative from all those available to him. His cousin, the administrative man, satisfices, which is a portmanteau of the words satisfies and sacrifices. I'd love if you shared this. I hadn't heard this before. It's fantastic. Well, let me step back a second. I, I think if you looked at the go-to 21st century companies that, uh, that I think many, many people, including myself, go to of, you know, over and over again, because maybe they're really the, the, the main ones, there are very few outside of them. Steve Jobs of Apple, it's Jeff Bezos of Amazon, it's Google, although there's you know, obviously changes that have happened as of late so it's not as much founder led but but these organizations that we look to you know that have really driven success are visionary led and you know the founders still at the helm there's not as many examples of managerially led firms that drive that visionary way of thinking and that transformative way of doing i mean the <clears throat> the one example that does come to mind of being different managerially led is, you know, when Lou Gerstner really drove the transformation of IBM, you know, from a hardware to a software to a services company combined, you know, that was somebody who was steeped in management. But yes, the the challenge that we face, you know, and that we talked about is this this notion of what administrative man is doing is this combination of just being satisfying and sufficing versus really trying to think about the long-term overall maximization. Another way to put it is, I think average management, you know, managerially led firms are focused, unfortunately, more on profitability than sustainability. And we have to figure out how we go back to creating this maximization in the long term. You know, I show a chart in the book that there's no observable correlation between long-term shareholder return versus ongoing, you know, trying to drive just margin expansion alone versus super strong correlation if we take long-term shareholder return and compare it to top-line revenue growth. These are a basket of the top 20 market cap US S&P 500 companies. So I think how do we get towards more sustainability 
along with profitability as opposed to having such you know a focus on profitability which i think unfortunately it's not only the managers uh, the leaders of companies but the whole ecosystem the stakeholders the fund investors we have to get to this ability to think longer term and actually drive from a longer term perspective because that's actually where the rewards ultimately come one of the things on genius moves i think that bezos did was from the very start he plowed profits back into the business and that became the normal so it was all long term but i wanted to bring it to incentives and rewards which you talk about in the book because for the modern world for this world of vuca where we're in an unbelievably complex business environment incentives and rewards are backwards and you said business leaders are being motivated and rewarded to heat their houses by burning their own furniture. Yeah, I think we see that, right, is that the short-term strategies, the shoring up of things to continue to meet the ramp up of quarter over quarter profits that so many companies face. And then that just gets exacerbated by the fact that individuals are rewarded for last year's successes. You know, the, the leadership, so much is being paid by how well they've done, you know, over the past year. Yet again, long-term shareholder value is really about investing for, you know, investors are really looking for for a company's future performance. So we have it swapped. You know, and I think that this has just become worse than ever, right? Is the only way to that they think to increase shareholder value is to raise expectations about the future. And so therefore, the only thing that executives can do is to invest in the short term to keep trying to make the case to hope for that better future. But at some point, you're literally burning the furniture, right, to heat the home. And it's a real problem. So, you know, that's why I said earlier, you take these cognitive biases, they're the nature of human beings, and the human beings create the rewards and incentives that just furthers exacerbates the problem of being short-term oriented, you know, which puts us in the predicament that we're talking about of, of the ability to vision and, and drive breakthrough growth. Most of us know the Apple story, but to tell it through the lens of a future back lens would be really interesting because no other business cases, no other recent business cases illustrate the power of, of envisioning the future and walking it back to the present than Steve Jobs and Apple and the digital hub. And the reason for that, Aiden, you know, and I you know, I at first hesitated to put the story in there, not too much because I thought the story was would, wouldn't be unique. I think it is, but but the perception of the story, you know, of Steve Jobs and Apple, and oh, here we go again. And like I said, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of examples to date, and hopefully this will change. You know, of true future back thinkers and planners. And, and Steve Jobs is a, and Apple is a, is such a great case study. If we can get past, you know, sort of all the lore about, well, you know, it was this larger of life person and he was this creative and, you know, all these things that happened that created these amazingly designed products. It was so much more fundamental to that and what Steve Jobs and, and his Apple leadership team did. You know, in fact, it wasn't just a few of his top leaders, his whole effort to create the digital hub and then the transformation of of the music industry and uh, and in and, and telephony, all of that was done together by imagining 10 years out from 2000. This is, by the way, during the dot-com crash, uh, compounded even before the dot-com crash with a belief that Apple as a niche, you know, high-end personal computer manufacturer was going to get commoditized. And Gateway CEO said for themselves that they believe themselves to become a commodity. So in the midst of all of that pressure to, you know, sort of hunker down on, if you will, the core computer business, Steve Jobs and these top 100 lieutenants looked out 10 years and they looked into the future and they weren't beholden to, you know, hey, how are we going to make a better computer or how are we going to make it? So it does more things so that we don't get commoditized. They actually went beyond the computer and they looked into other industries, into the existing consumer electronics of the day of 2000 and looked at digital cameras and personal digital advice devices and even the upcoming MP3 technology. And they said, 
you know, we know those devices are going to need a lot of computing power within them. That's going to make them really clunky as such small devices. Why couldn't we be the digital hub for all these devices? And they, in 2001, announced to the world the digital hub strategy, which they called it at the time. I would call it the digital hub vision of how they would enable through writing elegant software the connection of an Apple personal computer to these various devices. What they didn't share with the world was that they said, we could do these manufacture of these devices ourselves, and hence what they ultimately created as the iPod and the iPhone and the iPad. So they looked into the future, and it was more than just a vision statement. They they looked at how the world would be changing, how consumer electronics would evolve, how they'd be a big piece of our life. And they imagined not just a core computer business, but they imagined an adjacency called the digital hub. And they imagined how they got into creating their own consumer electronic devices, more than just a product, but but all of those actually were a different business model. The iPod it combined with the iTunes store, uh, combined with the software and the way that they drove a revenue model of giving away the iTunes music to make money on the iPod. That was a business model change. The iPhone was a fundamental business model change to the industry as it was a smartphone. It was a platform for apps as much as it was for telephony. Um, and then the iPad. So here is the consummate future back thinker and planner or strategist in the sense that they looked out 10 years. They didn't have the present forward fallacy problem. They did more than just a vision statement. They really created what Apple could be and should be for a better, a better organization, inspiring and purposeful. And then they brought that back to 2001, 2000, 2001, and they started building capabilities and software like, you know, um, iTunes software, uh, iMovie, you know, GarageBand. And then they built these products and they started with the iPod, then the iTunes service. Somewhere along the way, they ended up with Apple stores, but then it was the iPhone and then it was the iPad. So it's to me the amazing consummate story. Now, I don't think Steve Jobs had in mind future back. I think it was just who he was in his team in terms of intuitively doing it. But the whole point of the book is to mirror what has been successful industry transforming companies and seeing how they tie together this process of thinking in a visionary way to actually break through innovation growth initiatives. I think it's so important to really, in its fullness, share the story. It's a fantastic story. And it's a fantastic case study. And you're right, it's a pity we don't have more to tell. But one I am going to tell before the end of the show, and I think it's great, is you highlight the case study of William Height and Janssen. Height found himself in a typical situation that so many change makers do. His vision was a threat to the core. And the core is designed to stamp out variation and risk and therefore, many change makers like Height get rejected from the business, or they get hidden, or they get put in Sector 7G where nobody can hear them from <laughs> them again, or they're starved of budget in some way because of that threat to the core. But he managed to turn that around and embrace the core. I'd love if you shared this, Mark. It's really the central case study of part two application where we walk through how you develop a vision and how do you translate that you know, to strategy and then how you ultimately program and implement. And Bill Height was the was the head of R and D at Janssen, the pharmaceutical division of J and J. And this was, you know, roughly in the you know 2012 timeframe. He was uh, an oncologist by training, and he had led at a cancer institute before coming to to J and J. You know, and he talked. He had before I think even bringing this up to his teams a mind. You know, as he said, he was a practicing as an oncologist, and they his patients would say, "What could I have done to avoid getting cancer?" You know, and there was just this stark reality, you know, of seeing his patients die, and he just wondered, you know, why couldn't they do a better job of preventing cancer or intercepting the cancer causing process? So, you know, when he got to Janssen, you know, that was on his mind, you know, as they were helping for other diseases like Alzheimer's or diabetes and so forth. 
Um, so, you know, they wanted to look back and as a leader of a major healthcare company, as, you know, a $7 billion budget that he had, you know, he wanted to use use that platform of R&D, not to just predict what could come in time, but how could he make some things happen sooner rather than later? And as you said, it was incredibly disruptive to the organization because the entire Janssen Pharmaceuticals division is based on 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 fixing diseases with a pill or a drug that treats the problem once the problem exists, not trying to figure out how to prevent or intercept a disease or cure it. And for that matter, even if you did come up with that, how would you make money on something that you prevented? And you know, maybe it would be hard to know whether you really prevented it or intercepted it. You know, just it would be hard necessarily to prove it. So there were a lot of issues around being able to do that. Well, the long story short of it is he had to to convince his team about the vision that he had. He had to then develop that vision further out, carving out what ultimately was called World Without Disease and the Disease Interception Accelerator, and begin to think through. They went out uh, almost uh, 20 years to 2030 to begin to look at um, various trends, um, things like what's going to happen with biosensors and trackers, you know, what was going to be the reality of life sciences and how that was going to change, um, you know, how therapies could get more personalized. Anyway, they went through a whole set of different trends and, and, and points of inflection to land on 2030 as their target vision and began to, to think about what does it mean to have a world without disease? What does it mean in terms of the, the business and the business model and doing that? Um, you know, it ended up taking and walking that back to the present to be able to start with what is now a lung cancer initiative that is underway and has been underway to begin to intercept the disease of lung cancer and ultimately maybe even for many prevent it. And so Jansen and Bill Height came up with this vision of a world without disease, and it became this future that would trans that believed would be transformative to the industry whether they did it or not so why not have them do it it was something that felt to drive not just revenues and profits but again for humanity and purpose so it really inspired the organization it isn't to say that there doesn't continue to be challenges based on core resources and the business model of of driving traditional pharmaceuticals but the Janssen vision of the world without disease is a, another deep case example of where they worked in a future back way. They didn't stay beholden to the business model of Janssen, but they looked at to a, a different way of thinking and being, and they developed that vision. And then they translated into a strategy, meaning a portfolio of, of business in the, in the future, but then also bring that back to a portfolio of initiatives today, starting with the lung cancer initiative. So maybe I'll stop there because there's probably a lot to talk about in that. And I, I could go on and on about Bill Height. One of the challenges many of our listeners will have is how do I make that happen? Now, we're, we're not going to have any way near the time to do that, but you're very generous in the book where you give some toolkits that people can use and a way of thinking about how to implement as well. But I found it really interesting because you mentioned earlier on jobs to be done and Height and his team looked at how customers are dealing with eliminating sickness in the first place or avoiding it in the first place. And one of the things they looked at was herbal supplementation to ward off sickness. And I thought this was really, really interesting because this was a way of looking at what customers are doing, what are their behaviors, and how can I bring that from the future back? As you said, we probably won't have time to get into all the how-to, but I think it's important from a principle, you know, b before we get into the point about herbal supplements, is the principle here is to take and look into the future, not only just generally with trends and potential disruptions and, and points of inflection that can happen as trends converge, you know, to, to create, you know, a whole new paradigm or opportunity uh, for being able to develop a business or provide a service to society. In our mind, that almost sort of creates the circumstance. It has to tie back to what is the job to be done 
you know, what, what is a consumer or customer trying to get done in their life? And how does these trends and these convergence of trends in the future inform what are going to be the important and unsatisfied jobs of the future and, and use that as a way to, you know, to begin to think about how things will be different, how behavioral change could be different. And, you know, the whole supplements piece of that was just almost like a vignette to think about, you know, how do you begin to see what's going to be important to people? Well, you know, it's going to be more about maintaining their health as opposed to health care. So a big piece of the disease interception world without disease initiative was about the behavioral piece of this as much as it's sort of the traditional medical side to be able to form up how to be able to create this new paradigm, this new business for Janssen. And I think that's such an important way to think about it is what are people doing or what are the edge behaviors that I can observe and bring back to the core and examine? And this comes back to what you talked about earlier. You need to put time aside in order to discuss those. And that brings me to this one that I absolutely love. And it's why I work in organizational transformation coming from innovation, business models, et cetera, because I really find it's very difficult to change business models until you change mental models. You can't change what people do until you change how they think and how they interact. And you dedicate a lot of the book to this as well, because healthy debate, allowing people to promote half-baked ideas, et cetera, becomes really important. And we had the mother of psychological safety, Amy Edmondson, on the show before Christmas, and she talked about this, and it's so core to the idea of innovation and discussing the future. And you highlight the work of Carl Dweck, for example, and one exercise I thought was really useful, Mark, was the view of the world statements, and I thought it'd be a lovely way to finish today's show because it's what we all need to do individually as well. We need to almost envision where we want to be in the future, maybe in five-year increments or whatever, and then work back to today because time passes and it's coming for all of us. And hopefully this period of lockdown will give us the time to do that and reflect. And while we're cocooning, we can become a new being at the end of it. So I'd love if you'd share the view of world's exercise because I think beyond an organization, it's something we can do individually. You know, of the, of the three major steps, which is creating an inspiring and actionable vision, then converting vision to strategy, and then, and then programming and implementing, you know, the first major phase of creating a vision and having the right time horizon to create that vision, you know, first putting yourself in that future environment and having a view of the world. The example I use in the book is an automotive view of the world set of statements for 2030. And what's interesting, you know, kind of tying that to Carol Dweck, Aiden, and the, sort of the whole process of learning. When you go into the future environment, it can't be about facts and data, right? Because facts and data are driven from the present, from the past. When you really look forward, you're dealing with a transfer from facts and data. I mean, you can have some that, you know, I think on some tight trends, but predominantly you're into assumptions. You have to develop a set of assumptions about the way the world works and the way the world's going to work. You know, what are the assumptions that are the driving forces of change for your industry? You know, in the case I use in the book, it's for the automotive industry, because that becomes, this is what we call the the exploration piece of explore, envision, discover, which is a different, it's a learning wheel as opposed to operate and execute, which is really not about learning. It's about more about making decisions based on data and then moving forward. The view of the world statements, however, are something that get developed as a set of core assumptions based on a lot of conversation, a lot of iteration, a lot of debate and dialogue, a lot of divergence before convergence. You know, again, the senior leadership team should be doing this work and be highly participative because what we found is the success of any strategy being implemented, you know, based off the vision is to the extent that there's true alignment on the underlying assumptions that drive the vision and the strategy. Um, so it's a major first step of developing the vision is is beginning to develop these view of the world statements. I'll read just a couple, like in automotive, you know, we split them based on autonomy, electrification, and cities. You know, trying to sanitize this, but it was basically from a from a client of ours, and done in a way that it was generic for the purposes of putting in the book. 
But, you know, the example of electrification would be something like excluding regulatory incentives. The cost of ownership for electric vehicles will be on par with internal combustion vehicles in the 2030 to 2030 timeframe, depending on regional conditions and technology advancement. That's a view of the world statement where the team that we worked with was aligned behind that, that then informs in the implications of that assumption what they're going to actually do about it in the 2030 timeframe. And for this company, by the way, having gone through this and changed their point of view about what was going to happen in terms of the cost of ownership of electric vehicles, that fundamentally shifted the way they thought about development today and in the breadth of development of utilizing electrification technology. So all of this that we're talking about is about embracing just like an innovation team for a leadership team, a process of learning, being able to get really good about what it means to, to learn in an effective way as the other side of innovation that the leadership and key teams need to do, because that's how you get to this imaginative, what could be formation of the vision. That's what allows you to develop this future state portfolio as part of the strategy making process, it will not work unless you use some of these tools like view of the world statements, you use the forum to not be in a traditional operate and execute mode, but in this explore, envision, discover mode. These are the things that can allow an organization to be more effective at learning and creating well, at the same time as operating and executing, which is essential for its long-term sustainability. Yeah, I love that. And there's a, a quote I thought I'd, I'd leave today's show with that really struck a chord with me because this work can be difficult. Change is difficult. It's one of the most difficult things for a human being. It's actually painful to go through change and to rewrite mental models, et cetera, et cetera. But I love this quote, and I, I thought I'd leave it this quote before asking you, Mark, what your parting message is for the listener, both as a business leader, an innovation worker, and an individual who wants to change. But here's the quote. You said, the aha moment that comes out of this work isn't always a brilliant new thought or a penetrating analysis. Often it comes from a place of emotion as leaders let go of their defensive denials and embrace a reality that they had subconsciously anticipated or feared. Because we all have this inkling deep down that change is required and denying it is actually denying evolution itself. And that's how I love to think of this book, that you're giving us a roadmap of how to reinvent not only organizations, ourselves, but also possibly society. So with that, Mark, I'd love you to share your parting advice for our listener, both as individuals, as organizations and industries. You know, maybe I would... I'd like to close with a reference to the Harvard Business Review online article that that just published, you know, about um, leaders, you know, having a vision of the post COVID nineteen crisis, the importance of that. You know, I in that article, you know, which I think applies to how we put things in the book, but it just really puts a bright light on the way things are today with the COVID crisis. You know, we talk about it being more important than ever in vision. Why is it more important than ever to have vision aside from being able to provide the impetus for long-term, you know, being able to think in the long-term and bring that alive? Vision is important more than ever because people, your organization, even the, le the leadership group and people in the organization underneath, there's got to be a North Star and it's got to be more than just a one to two sentence statement, you know, that will be the best medical supply company in the world and, you know, make the best products. It's got to inspire the organization to, to that better place. Um, it has to give it purpose. Um, it has to give it hope. And the vision role, the role of vision is to be able to do that. And it's got to be practical. So we've got to be able to think kind of like the Steve Jobs digital hub beyond the computer and the opportunity of their own consumer electronics. If you make it tangible like that, you can give the organization the direction and the stability to say, we know where we want to go, where we want to be two, three, four, five years past this crisis. It's about the storytelling and the narrative 
of that vision and its purpose and hope. And then the strategy piece is the conversion to the engineering, if you will, of how that literally translates ultimately into initiatives that you need to do to address the immediate crisis. Those are the core things. But also it gives clarity on some things that you'd want to start today as investments and initiatives to help you get to the other side and be ready and placed in the next 12 to 24 months, but also for this long-term place that you want to land. And so it's getting you to be able to have a better informed view about balancing the things that absolutely have to be done right away with those few things, that 10 to 20% that are preparation for the post-COVID world. And that all ties to a process, as I said, of learning and engaging and evolving and shaping points of view. And I would just hope for your audience that that they would embrace the notion that, yes, we need to react, we need to operate, execute, we need to be present forward. But we also, even in the midst of this crisis, need to carve out this time to give our organization hope with vision and to give us practicality with initiatives that are informed by that vision and a relentless ongoing pursuit of learning to navigate as we bring that vision and those plans forward into time. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful way to finish. Mark, where can people find out more about you and the work of Inesight and your book, etc.? Well, Inesight.com, you'll find all sorts of the work in, uh, in the book, I believe. Aside from you can find the book on Amazon, we have a landing page called futurebackleadership.com where you can find more of the particulars about the book. And then, of course, I am always happy to engage directly in conversation. And I'm at mjohnson at inosite.com is my direct email. Author of Lead from the Future, How to Turn Visionary Thinking into Breakthrough Growth. Mark Johnson, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aiden. 